that the room fills up and then we start with the activity. Now we are also live on Facebook, so greetings to all our viewers on Facebook. We're happy to have you with us tonight. Just give us one extra minute that we still wait for some participants uh, on Zoom coming in. And prepare your drinks for the, for the video, which we'll see soon. Ah, Ruth seems to know Nina. <laughs> we we'll just give it 30 seconds and then the other participants can still come in any time. Okay, so I think we are good to go. So I welcome you everybody and wish you a good afternoon. Welcome to the launch of our second film on Kenyan business heroes. And um, today a feature on the struggles of Ms. Ruth Abada, who is with us here today. I'm very happy about that. I am Dr. Jan Czarnitzki. I'm the country director of Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Kenya. And before we start the seminar, let me please give you a short update in the background about our foundation. So Konrad Adenauer Stiftung, or short CAS, is a German political foundation that um, works on democracy and good governance all over the world. And um, we always try to connect the stakeholders in the country we work with, with stakeholders in Germany. Um, we believe that democracy needs a fair and inclusive economic system and one concept that we offer to support this fair and inclusive economic system is social market economy. And we as CAS would like to make this concept better known in Kenya. And we hope that it may be used in debates about economic reforms that actually, as you all know, coming up right now in times of crisis. After the crisis, there comes a solution. So maybe aspects of social market economy may be something to consider here. Um, and that is also why we, to make this concept better known, started a series of short films that should highlight basic aspects of social market economy. And um, we had a first film about two months ago in which we showed the struggle of Dr. Maxwell Okos, um, where we could show a lot many aspects and many obstacles that an entrepreneur has to overcome in Kenya when he or she wants to start a business. Today, in our second film, um, we show how Ruth Abadi um, especially worked on social questions as an entrepreneur um, and what you need to consider to make your business work well, to make you earn money, but at the same time, make sure that your employees also don't suffer. That's a basic aspect of social market economy because social market economy means that you have a free market where you can start your business and let it run freely, but at the same time should consider social aspects like the welfare of your workers. And social market economy means that you, cannot, you should not have an advantage if you treat your employees badly. And theoretically, if you would do that um, without any legal and uh, also um, yeah, social frameworks, then it would be cheaper to produce the same product when you treat your workers badly. That should not be the case. And that's why we also would like to discuss afterwards how Kenyan politics can make sure that an entrepreneur actually has an advantage when he or she um, does something good for the employees and also for a society at large. Um, when we started to think about this series of films, um, I was sitting on my veranda together with Ravi, who you see also on the screen today, and we wanted to do a nice film that we could show in, in cinemas. The idea was to show the film in a cinema room and also to have a discussion on the podium in the cinema afterwards and have some popcorn and a uh, cold drink and discuss on that 
physically. I still hope that this will be possible in the future where we, when we will have overcome the issue of Corona, but at the moment we cannot do this. So we tried to do the best out of that and do webinar, a webinar to showcase the first film about two months ago. And we actually had the experience that this worked really well. So we had lots of feedback, lots of viewers. Um, so a webinar is maybe the second best solution if you compare it with a night at the cinema, but it's still good. And that's why we decided after the good experience of the first launch of the, of the film about Dr. Okoff to do webinars every, every week. So all every Monday at 6 p.m. Um, you could, um, could switch to our Facebook channel or to, to Zoom and see a discussion about up-to-date political topics um, yeah, done by CAS. And we, of course, are happy that people that have not switched in by now would do this next week and the weeks after that. Um, it's not easy. It's quite some work to not only to produce a film, but also to prepare things like a webinar. That's why I would like to, to um, thank my team at CAS to have made this possible. And also all of you here um, that are here today to also make this an interesting and um, valuable discussion. Um, this Zoom webinars are similar to a real seminar in which we'll be in a, in a big room together. So everybody who is here in, in Zoom, also on Facebook or Twitter, can ask questions. Um, on Zoom, you can actually do this through the chat, also the question and answer session. And we will make sure that we will consider all questions that are raised. So it doesn't matter if you are in Zoom or if you are on Facebook. Um, ask questions in the, on the social media platform. Christoph Schmidt, who is um, also visible on the screen right now, uh, collects all these questions and makes sure that nothing is forgotten. And you can also do this via Twitter under the hashtag social market economy KE. Um, and also on Twitter, we will follow that and make sure that everything is, is replied to. If it's not done live, because we only have one and a half hours, and answers will come over the social media pages. Um, yes, so I don't want to bore you any longer um, because I'm looking forward to the film very much. Um, our moderator, Josiah, will, after we see the film, will introduce the participants that are here with us today. Um, and then I'm looking forward to a good discussion and a great film. So without further ado, I wish you a wonderful film. Enjoy it and see you after the film again. Um, thank you very much, Jan, and uh, everyone else who is on board. Under ordinary circumstances, that is the point when everyone else would be giving you an applause to clap their hands and say, uh, you've done a good job doing the introductory bit. Uh, but now on Zoom, we know people are clapping with their hearts or at their hearts. Uh, generally, as you've been told, this is the second uh, launch of the films. The first one was about Dr. Koth, who did an exemplary job. And today we are actually featuring another person who has done an exemplary job within the Kenyan scene. Uh, with us today, we have a great panelist of team that are going to incisively give you information and answer your questions. But sometimes they're also going to ask questions amongst each other so that they can just get to understand in context the aspect that we're discussing. If you are a participant, please kindly do follow us on Twitter. That is at is Cass Kenya, Cass underscore Kenya. And we have a conversation that is going on using the hashtag social markets KE. Please kindly do follow through and ensure we engage online in every possible way. Today we have amongst us a gentleman who for a very long time, he has been in the political scene for a longer period of time. So then he understands the political landscape. He is the executive director for Ford Kenya. Sir, you're welcome. I know the last few weeks it's been upheavals, but to see you here, then we know Mok has been quelled and you're finally here to roll with us and tell us the political scene has been in pertaining to some of the things that we're discussing, is called Stephen Kesa. So you're welcome. 
Also with us is a tonality who has graced your living rooms on a number of occasions. Now she's with the beautiful television. She's called Terian Chebet. Also, as you've heard, Jan is also a panelist who is just spoken to you. The person who has made this together, the idea behind the TV and also the director of the film that we're going to see today is Nan Ravi Kamalka, who is the director and the CEO founder of Kama Fiction Africa. My co-moderator is going to be Christoph and is going to be the technical guy behind the situation that you see when they come to the four eventually, then you will know that it's Christoph who has brought them on board. Finally, ladies we have the lady of the moment, the heroine of the hour, none other than Ruth. The story is going to be, it's going to move you and you're going to really look at it and wonder, say, so great things are happening in Kenya, great things are happening in Africa, great things are turning the tides. She's an impeccable lady, but before I extol much of her, I'm going to roll over this to my co-moderator, Christoph, who is going to queue in the film that we're launching today. Christoph, I hand this over to you. When I was one, five, six years old, I used to do a lot of art. It was one of the favorite things that I really liked doing. I painted a lot of landscapes, still lifes. Now I can call myself a designer, <laughs> you know. I can be able to say that I've become good at it also because of practice and doing it all my life. The journey of a designer was a long way. I studied in the University of Nairobi. We studied stuff like chemistry, and I remember in my first year, I wondered why. According to me, it was all supposed to be just about art. In my third year, I did industrial design, which was more three-dimensional, which is what I really enjoyed. We had a mini exhibition at the Gote Institute where my year decided that we wanted to showcase work. Someone saw it and that's how I got a job. It was mostly interiors, that's what my boss did. And I came in as a product designer. It was also more like a learning experience. During that time, we decided to challenge ourselves into something different. And I remember her saying that she'd applied for, um, as an exhibitor, for the Kenya Fashion Week then. Her idea was to create garments that light up in the stage, like metal outfits with like, the brief comes out and it's all supposed to be in fabric and we're like, oh. I started learning about like fabrics, how they behave, complexions, color. I did that for two years in a row and, and I was just, I, I needed something more. I got a job in an NGO. I was pretty young, maybe 26, 27. And I had to manage artisans and the students and create a symbiotic relationship between the two of them. Working at the NGO helped me understand you need each other. It's not about just crafts and hobbies, but it's about being able to change someone else's life by creating employment. After 
of her NGO, of course, the job ended. I needed a full-time job. I needed money. The easiest thing that I knew I could make money with was fashion. And it was a way for survival, to be honest. Starting a business from my house was one of the most <laughs> scary things, I guess. I bought an overlocking machine, cost like, then I think it was 8,000 or something. Employed a tailor, got contacts for people, did pop-up shops. The first pop-up I remember was at the village market. We could only make like, I think in a day, three dresses, and that was like pushing it. My sister and a really close friend, who was also staying with us, would go to the exhibition and sell, and would keep calling them, did you sell, did you sell? And one day she said, they sold 34,000, and it felt like a jackpot. Working with the tailor <laughs> uh, was a challenge. It was a very difficult, you know, telling him what to do and how to do it. He was more skilled, he had more experience. I knew what I wanted. One day he just said, oh, I got someone who's going to pay me more money and left. In 2011, I went to school. It was a different experience. It was extremely expensive. My sister helped pay. My ex-boyfriend also helped pay during times when I was defaulting. So I started learning how to make bags. We made bags three months straight every day. It was one of the things that when you came out of, you felt accomplished. That realization gave me a burst. So in 2012, when I came back, I was like feeling creative overboard. I knew I wanted to use African print. And that's when I started. I'm excited. I want to start making leather bags. And I go to the tannery. There is leather. But the guy says all the leather is being bought and sent to China in the blue form. That's the time when we decide to go into upcycling. Buying leather jackets, leather trousers and using it. It never crossed my mind that I needed to borrow a loan from the bank. The bank needed something that I never had. Uh, a car, a title deed. So I didn't, it never crossed my mind that I had to go to the bank and get money, no. So I made money out of corporate work, making uniforms and all this stuff, deadline after deadline, searching for material, making samples. And the time came when I was just like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> reduced the amount of corporate work, became more authoritarian about what I really wanted to do. You want your business to be based on various things. Trust was one of them, honesty was another. And build it more like a family setting, which is what I wanted it to be. Your workers uh, tend to be more confident to talk to you about their personal issues. And they also sometimes want help with uh, problems they have. They want to borrow money. And uh, you become sympathetic. I started giving money in form of loans. But the thing was, the loan was not personal. It was business money that I was loaning. And they would pay in months, but in little bits. So the business started to suffer. At that point, I realized that it was okay when there were one or two people, three people. But once you become five, six, and everybody's borrowing a whole lot sum of money, you have no money for business anymore. emotionally frustrating and draining, always having to 
carry everybody's burden behind your back. And I said, if we keep going on, we're not going to be able to have anything uh, running as a business. We have to come up with a solution. And the solution was that we save money every month. Everybody contributing means everybody can kind of be able to draw money off it, to use it on one of those cloudy days when you really need the money. burden from the business changed. It, it became better. Have I thought about going to the bank and take a loan after all these years? No. I've tried once when I thought, oh, I need to buy more machinery. I want to expand this thing. I didn't get it. The fact that I have had so many employees and then I have so much overheads. I feel like I already have too much on my plate. I don't want any more. Do I enjoy my success economically? Not really. <laughs> but uh, psychologically, yes. Having a business that has uh, been the way it is now, has been based on the fact that uh, you have to learn to respect each other. Because I feel like, one, I have a team I can depend on. Two, I have a team I can trust. Three, um, I have done the best I can to make their lives more comfortable. The richness of my business is being able to pay people comfortably, uh, being able to take care of the people that work for me. And their families or people that are extended to their families depend on them and that they are able to also take care of them for me is a blessing. Sorry for that. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Ruth Abade, the founder of Black Fly Designs, a lady who has made strides within the country and even beyond the borders. But Ruth, when somebody sees your story right now, and probably just to the, the, after watching all that then, how does it make you feel about your journey? Is it something that is worthwhile? Are you proud that you took it? and just, just walk us through the moment of watching this come to life. Um, I think it's been, um, you know, the journey doesn't stop. Every, every, single, every single thing you do, every moment you have always has like challenges you have to face. Uh, I think it's also a little bit different because if, it's not a hobby. I mean, designing is a fact like, I knew for sure I wanted to be a designer. I didn't know that, you know, when you start a business, how people say things like, uh, um, no one really tells you the more people you have, the more challenges you get. No one tells you that. Well, you need to have more people, you know? Um, so it's been like, you have to learn the trades on your own. 
And all those challenges, I think, are also different depending on each person's business and experience. And having to have gone through different work uh, experiences with different people and companies, it kind of molds you and prepares you for the process of actually building a business. So, so far I can say I've done the best I can. And I think as a designer and other aspiring designers as well, you just have to do the best you can. I think it's better sometimes to do the best you can and then other people can be ready to come and help you do the other part that you can't do by yourself. Um, but so far it's been a good journey. Back to the moment. Uh, Ruth, if, if I could take you back to the moment when uh, you knew as a young child that you loved designing and you're drawing and you're sketching. Then later on, you ventured into work, employment scene, and then that landed you somewhere. Were you conflicted in mind? How did you get to finally design that and decide that this is my thing and this is what I'm going to pursue? I'm not going to pursue law. I'm not going to pursue journalism. I'm not going to be an actuarial a scientist and any of that kind. When did you, the bad moment that this is my thing? I think you don't necessarily have a moment when you actually grow. I mean, the people who say, when I grow up, I want to be a designer or an artist. I think when, when you were younger, we didn't know what design was. We, we just drew, you know? You, you, and everybody would ask you, can you do a portrait of me? That's all we knew. We didn't know it would go and become a business kind of idea. So when I started, I didn't, I'm not necessarily a business oriented person. I just call myself a designer. That's all I know. Uh, the business part comes when people start to appreciate what you do. And then you realize, oh, you can actually make, make money out of it. But for the longest time, it's just a hobby, you know, until you realize that, oh, you can make money. That's one thing. The other thing is a lot of people see the things you don't see about yourself. So I still get people who say you're extremely talented. You do really well. That's how they see you can make so much money out of this. But I don't see it that way because I don't look at it as a business kind of view. I look at it more like I'm a designer. I like what I do and what I do makes me money, which is great. Okay. Uh, Bona Steven. You've lived longer within the political scene and borrowing heavily from our background. Fashion and design were not considered to be some of the heaviest beats in terms of employment, in terms of the job market and things like that. How does this shift the workspace and the employment space for the youth especially? Please kindly put on your microphone. Your microphone is off. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, uh, thank you. May I start by congratulating our dear lady for the long journey that uh, she has uh, tracked up to where she is. Uh, looks like her career was uh, naturally made and uh, She's really kept the faith uh, with it. Uh, very thankful. And uh, secondly, I think uh, her personal ambition and uh, 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 let's say uh, actualization, that is in terms of wanting to do what she wants and not what others want her to do, I think is the best quality and the character I've seen in her, and uh, I wish her well in this long journey. And the third important thing I've discovered about her is the distinctive motherly, sisterly instinct in her behavior, in her character, that makes her workers look like her sisters and brothers, sort of siblings, and not just people coming. Uh, I mean, not taking a casual attitude towards these very important associates who keep our work going. And uh, 
this is something very unique, very peculiar, that is not common with most employers. Most employers are very ruthless, very selfish, extortionists, and uh, she has stood out as a different being in this industry, and I like her for that. Now, coming back to the challenges facing our youth, I think uh, Hass is a singular case because she has decided to do what she wanted right from youth up to where she is. Uh, she hasn't lost her way uh, anywhere along the way, although she got into employment somewhere, but she realized that is not her calling. Her calling is to employ or to actualize herself. And I like that very much. Now, how many of our youth look at life realistically in that manner? Uh, this is the big challenge that we have. And this is the center of unemployment in our Mideast. And the biggest challenge that our government have because uh, it has a big, a section of the youth that it has to employ to keep going. And yet we do not have enough jobs even to absorb a quarter of them. So uh, giving a political approach to employment the resolution in this country from my later experience is not a small matter because most of our leaders are money hunters. They want quick wealth and uh, unfortunately Fortunately, they have passed this disease uh, to many of our youth, uh, such that any opportunity they get uh, closer to an organization, closer uh, to an enterprise, is simply to take as much uh, of what they can from it instead of giving in uh, the much they can to make the business or the enterprise grow. So how uh, our dear lady has money to school the few uh, workers she has into understanding that uh, her enterprise is theirs and uh, together they must put in as much as they can is the best thing and the best example that we must take the youth in a big way yeah, so that those who can borrow from Ali, if I think, do that and uh, okay. the unemployment rate will go down. Okay. So when we were doing the chit chat the other day on Friday, one of the questions that was asked, and I know many people would want to ask as well, is how do we identify the business heroes that we do feature? The last time it was a doctor today, so I know next time it be somebody else. So how does Kass come up and identify this is the hero that we're going to talk about? Is that my question? That is for Dr. Yan. The question is oh, for Dr. Yan. Thank you. Sorry, the audio was not perfect. Um, yes, I can get back again to the, the evening when I said on my veranda with Ravi. <laughs> I'd like to come back to that point where we were structuring this uh, series of, um, of short films. And we were discussing about who could be the business heroes. And as I also described last time, we did a research on that. So we actually had people researching on um, people that have an interesting business idea and that also have an interesting story to be told. So we didn't want to look for somebody who, who just received some seed money from development agencies and could just start a business smoothly and had all their support. We were looking for people that actually had an inspiring idea and had to fight all the way through. And I think that's also well documented in the film we just saw, that Ruth just didn't start doing what she does now, but there were many steps to be taken and there were also many points where it maybe also could have gone somewhere else or could even have failed, huh? but it did not because she carried on doing what she wanted to do and she overcame all the obstacles. And I think for this film we have today, it's especially important, and that's also why we wanted her to be on the film, that the story doesn't end where the business is established, but it goes on because then, as you just said, the more you grow, the more difficult it gets. And I think if you want to have a growing economy with um, also with lower unemployment rates, we need businesses to also grow, as Stephen just said. Huh? And that also is something to be discussed today and also maybe in um, the days that, that follow this discussion with um, 
Um, what can be done in the political field? What policy frameworks do we need to also help small and medium-sized companies to grow and to, to make it easier for them to grow to create more employment? Um, and that's also what we can show with the film of Ruth right now. And that's why she fits wonderfully in, into this series of films. And we actually did not um, decide on a third video right now, so we will need to do other research for that. But it's not that we just pick somebody we know, but we do intensive research um, on people that fit well to this series and tell an interesting story that hopefully is inspire, it's an inspiration for people that look and watch us today. And what is always important for cast activities, that after that we can do something concrete out of that. So it's not that we just want to watch a movie or watch a film, but we would like to start a political movement out of that. So okay. that's Okay, thank you so much, Jan. Cherian, I'm coming to you, and uh, I'm going to ask you this question on the capacity as a media personality, but I'm also going to ask you this as the chairperson of the Pan-African Women Entrepreneurs. And where is the space for women entrepreneurs in Africa? And where is the space for the women entrepreneurs in the media? Do you think that the media helps cover uh, the women entrepreneurs a lot? Well, thank you very much um, for that question. And uh, just before I respond, I want to thank uh, Ruth for sharing her story. Really, really inspirational. It really tells of your resilience um, and your passion as well. So, and of course, you know, such a great way and just using the power of storytelling to, you know, to make a difference, um, to inspire other young people. And you know, to just say that you know, business doesn't become a success overnight. So I've really enjoyed um, watching that story and I'm looking forward to seeing it again. So thank you so much, Ruth, for, for sharing your story. On the issue of women and uh, women entrepreneurs in the media, um, suffice to say, uh, we know how you know, the Kenyan media space has been, especially over the last couple of months. So the challenge, um, the onus is all up to us as women in the media to begin to, to find stories, you know, such as um, the story of Ruth, the story of Maxwell, as well as we saw the last time, and making sure that more and more people get to interact with such incredible and amazing stories that are happening out there. Yes, the media as we know it today is, you know, sort of flooded with politics and, and, and drama, but um, you know, it's partnerships like this that begin to elevate this conversation. It's it's um, you know sessions like this that begin to then ask um, challenge us to ask ourselves the hard questions: Are we giving women entrepreneurs a platform to speak, uh, not only for them to speak and showcase their businesses, but just the impact that that would have on other young entrepreneurs, other women entrepreneurs, somebody who might have access to some sort of capital, but is just thinking, oh, let me wait for a job and see. So, um, well, the challenge is up to us. We, and I have taken it personally, just listening to today's and last week's, I mean, last, um, I, I think it was last month or the month before, uh, that it's, it's time for us to tell the stories. And if, if I may add, uh, just picking up from what Ruth was uh, talking about and looking at how she was taking care of her workers, this is a segment of the society that's uh, quite critical, you know, tailors, um, and that space that, you know, is still not taken as a real job, you know, in, in some spaces. So giving, creating jobs, and not only doing that, but actually encouraging them to create what she called a solidarity fund, to make sure that you know, you know, I'm taking care of you. So I enjoy coming to work. I love being here. So I think it's such a great um, culture that Ruth has grown within her her company. And imagine what the trickle down effect of that could be when other people, other entrepreneurs hear them, because they go through the same challenges. And imagine if every small company decided, I'm going to take care of my workers. I'm going to encourage them to set up a fund so that all of us can take care of each other. I think that's, uh, that for me really, really stood out. And from a journalistic point of view, I'm now thinking those are the stories that we need to tell, you know, of people who are making a difference to, to the economy, of people who are making a difference to the societies that they live in. Ravi. As 
the person who has given life to this story on film. Definitely they, they, there was life to this story, but you've given it life on film. What are some of the things that captivated you the most when you're working with Ruth and just telling out her story? Well, um, um, for me, the main topic is uh, this, um, let's call it social security fund. Uh, Ruth has installed after going uh, through, through some issues she had also giving, uh, giving loans out of the company money. So she told it herself much better than I can do. But for me, this was really outstanding. And let's not forget, it's all, all about social market economy. So um, Dr. Jan already mentioned that we had uh, discussions um, right at the beginning of the project, like also, you know, where, where are uh, entrepreneurs here in Kenya who are quite near to the, and to the aspect of social market economy? So, um, and uh, in Ruth, I found somebody who is very, very near to, uh, very near to this ideal of the social market economy, the way she managed to, to um, bind all her workers in. And as we already, as she told us, uh, after, after installing this uh, solidarity fund in her company, even this was a boost also for her workers to uh, feel more attached and, to, uh, and be able to identify quite more with the company than they did before. So I think this uh, is really, really um, a super model, which uh, young entrepreneurs could try to implement also in their, their businesses. Uh, so for me, it was very clear that uh, Ruth is a business, uh, uh, is a role model and a real Kenyan business hero as she, what she did, you know, that's it. Ruth, getting back to you again, I say, uh, could you tell us the details about raw materials, getting the right labor force? How, how was that experience and challenge for you to just put Black Fly together and have something that now works for you, both in terms of capacity of human labor as well as the raw materials that are available? Okay, so it's been a challenge. I mean, I understand that when I, when I began, I began with a concept of, I think that's most business people, most designers that don't always start with what you have. If you have 2000 shillings and you have a vision, start with that. Just remember that for everything you do, Save a little so that with your business, when you get more orders, you have something. You don't have to ask. You might ask because you might get more than you need, but at least you save slowly by slowly until you build it up. So it'll take time. Um, I have traveled a lot. And every time, of course, when you travel, when you travel, like when I was in school and I, I, I was studying, they, there's always this feeling when you come back home, you feel more Kenyan when you're abroad than when you're here, weirdly enough. So when you, when, when, you, when you start to feel like that because you travel a lot, you always, when you get an opportunity to travel for exhibitions or you know, any of those platforms, you really want to market your country. There's some sort of proud that you gather. Now, the thing is because when I travel to the US, um, most of the things I want to support is African material. And that has been terrible. Why? Because I print my own fabric in Tanzania. I have to pay customs when I bring it in. I use cotton from Tanzania, but it's supposed to be free trade. You, we don't have cotton here. We don't have a ginery here. We don't produce our own fabric here. And if we do, it'll probably be from China. So what do I do? I go and support the women who make material in Tanzania, buy from them and bring it. If I always have to pay customs for making fabric for myself, then I think, you know, that's why everybody's buy is using Kitenge fabric because you still pay customs and it's cheaper. I travel to Nigeria because I think the, the, the hub of fabrics is in Africa. Like in South Africa, they have their own fabric. In Cameroon, they have their own fabric. 
you know in nigeria they have their own fabric but it is really really difficult to import fabric like the shipping cost is so high that it does doesn't make sense for customs it's been an issue because i feel like the government is supposed to assist when it comes to customs if if you don't have fabric in this in this country if you don't have cotton for example we want to use organic cotton we want to help the farmers with cotton but we don't have it i don't understand why if i get fabric from nigeria which is or Burkina faso which is organic cotton why i have to pay it like the government should let people have fabric for free you shouldn't be paying customs because we don't produce it i think the reason why you're supposed to have customs is so that you can re protect the indigenous you know manufacturers but what if we don't we we don't have it so you're not necessarily protecting the small businesses but you are hurting the small businesses because we don't have the material so why can you give us the material so that we can be able to add a little bit of value and sell it so that when we sell it then we make more money you know, so that has been a huge challenge when it comes and it's it's sometimes very easy to to not look at it that way when it comes to bigger businesses, you know, like factories that import fabric and the customs are really small, but when you're a really small entrepreneur, you have big, usually you have big dreams, you want to export, you want to sell your things abroad. Uh, and abroad doesn't have to always be Europe and America. Like I want to be able to sell my things in South Africa. And I want people to buy from Nigeria, add value and send it back to Nigeria. You know what I mean? But if it becomes so expensive, then it, you realize it's cheaper for me to produce to Europe and to send it to Nigeria because then I'm going to charge, they're going to charge me cash in Nigeria. Which has happened before. So it, it becomes really like a slippery slope to development. And I think some of the challenges that we're going through are small, small businesses, whereby we can't necessarily grow to a platform where you can now say, you know what, I can be able to to not necessarily empower the people who work for me, but also empower the people who support me. So I have been to, I have been able to, through a friend, get a project in Dadab. Amazing, you know, people don't even know about it. The 50 women, they have a women group, they produce really nice fabric scarves that they, that the, they could sell to the world. That's when it's 50 women is an industry. There's no reason this through probably like angels. Then it only help you in period. Mentoring. And usually it's just about mentoring. And that's why sometimes I think when I say that I've had I have had an honest, you know, like experience working with one uh, designer and then working with an NGO, it kind of opens up the mind about how things actually work. And then you're able to streamline which direction you want to go. And I think that's how I'll be able to deal with the issues that I'm going through. Some positive, some negative. I mean, not all of it is negative because I think I've done a lot more than a lot of people also through in this whole you know phase that I'm going through. But I think what I think the government me is, you know, just having to um, deal issues where how can small businesses be able to offer material, not necessarily because there's a goa, which is good, okay. like in Africa, you know. Okay. Start from Uganda or Tanzania um, at a more subsidized rate than most other countries, most other you know countries that we deal with. Okay, and and this is where now I I want Dr. Stephen to chip in. And having had 
how passionate she is about the policies that we have in place. Do you feel that the government has enough policies that can protect the small entrepreneurs or the startup companies and such <clears throat> like things? Is the, policy, is the policy space sufficient enough? Wana Seven. Um, uh, it's a sad state of affair. Uh, the type of uh, civil service, uh, the departments of government or the ministries that we have, I think are not people-centered. Uh, they are more of the extortionist organizations or cartels uh, that uh, are looking for quick kills in terms of personal gain. And they don't care about our uh, budging entrepreneurs like Led Ruth and the many more. So the rest are just left on their own and they have to swim among these sharks to distinguish themselves up to the level they have reached. It's a sorry state of affair that our civil servants go to office trying to find out how much they can make from the office and from anybody coming in, but not giving a service to make this country grow economically and in other respects. Right. We, we are operating under a very sorry state of affair in terms of public service. Well, Stephen, are we going to remain in this story state or is there hope that this is going to change? And if there is hope, when are we looking for the solutions? Because I know I'm asking this because I know Ford Kenya has members of parliament in parliament. So how come they are not instituting policies that are sufficient enough to protect the ordinary Kenyan that is just trying to start off? Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are encountered in very vicious political conflicts that uh, are uh, given big headlines everywhere. So and so quarreling, so and so trying to overdo uh, this camp and the other camp, and they're spending so much resources in that conflict instead of turning an eye on the social welfare and the economy of the country. So we really are in a mess, let me admit, and uh, most of our uh, people's representatives, be they the MPs or the legislature and the executive, it's like they are all pursuing the same goal of self-gain and not about developing the country. Uh, so we just have to keep shouting, particularly the voice of reason from the uh, uh, Omutatas plus other individuals and organizations who thinks and who knows for true that uh, the, the public service is not performing. Because we are simply pushing into executive positions people who say I've been too much in the call and it's my time to eat, but it's not my time to offer service to this nation. So the morality of service in this country has gone down. Likely we have serious instruments we put in place to check this uh, incident, but uh, we need charismatic fellows in office, I think, to do that. The first one is fully operationalizing our constitution 2010. It has uh, some of the best provisions that uh, are godly because when you look at what God desires in the Bible and other scriptures, you find it in our constitution. It's embodied there. But how much of it are we imbibing, inculcating, and giving out to make sure that uh, uh, we uh, offer so much to this country? When you come to chapter six, it speaks all and it has set up instruments that are supposed to check morality and restore morality in this country. The anti-corruption unit, we have the judiciary, but are they, have they been given the leeway or are they being supported to achieve this for this country? So the big moral question, uh, the big problem we have in this country is the moral factor. How do we morally rearm our civil service 
rearm our youth and everybody to think like our dear lady Ruth, who from no end in her own way is making a whole difference. Yeah, so that instead of showcasing too many things in the media, I think we come up with this mentoring initiatives like has to help other people uh, fend for, some, for themselves and also uh, render something to the nation. So we need to change the leadership, but we need to inculcate more morals and responsibility across the board in our society. So if we are you, leaning if towards- If I hear you right, then, if I hear you, you. then what you're saying is that there is no hope in the soonest or in the nearest future for the ordinary Kenyan. Basically, we are on yeah, our- Not in the present government, not in the present government. Uh, Ruth, if I could just take you back to the issue, and it's been raised by one of the attendees on online. How has the second-hand clothes affected uh, your work? Uh, do you get have a scenario whereby uh, the, the market has been just tilted in favor of the local designs, or uh, it's been in tilted in the favor of second-hand clothes? And this also comes to accusations that probably the locally produced uh, uh, items are a little bit expensive. How do you respond to that? Okay, so for the, for the second-hand market, I mean, I do a lot using the second-hand, you know, uh, the second-hand materials. Like I mentioned in the documentary, I use a lot of leather. Um, sometimes I, I look at it like it's a good thing. But at the same time, I think not because, okay, so now at this point, there's no imports of secondhand clothes. Let's, let's put aside the fact that there are all these people who depend on it. What if we, once it runs out, we have no factories that are producing material, like absolutely none. So what does that mean? It means that most of the people who depend on it, we have to now start buying brand new clothes, probably from Turkey, from China, which is a little bit more expensive. Um, when you, when you, of course, when I started, I, I did a lot of research about it. You know, uh, I, I, I studied a lot. And it's, I think it's also important for a lot of people who do a lot of design to just understand what you're working with the deals that happen with secondhand markets you know you saw that in rwanda when the government uh, the us burned it because it's a business someone is bringing in stuff in in connection with you know if i do this i get this in return we have a lot of secondhand stuff in the us so we need to dump it somewhere it, it's understandable but at the same time it's become a business it's not charity anymore it's become a business when it stops, like now, there's no import of secondhand material coming in. Uh, what are the people who design? Leave alone the secondhand people like me. Okay, I think I'm a creative, so I'll come up with a solution. But there are a lot of people who might not be able to think like me. But those people who just production in making fabric and reusing that fabric to make, you know, they have like a greener. Uh, economy where they're thinking I want to reuse and recycle and upcycle that's one story but then if we end up having to use new material then I think that's the problem because I don't think the government has really thought about it I don't think the government has a solution that when it actually does stop will we be going to Pika Mills or Rivertex does Rivertex produce you know materials that we need I need tannery, I need leather. Can I go to a tannery and get leather at a little bit subsidized rate, you know, which I can be able to actually make and sell at a profit? I don't think those, some of those policies the government has thought about. I don't think the government has actually thought about the, the, the fact that they say that it's good for the be building a you know, an economy where we can actually produce our own stuff. But I don't think it actually does exist. It, it makes sense if it was done maybe like two, three years ago, we built our own, we produced our own cotton. There's no one doing 
Yeah. No farmers who are, there are no generies. So in other words, what the government is going to end up doing is still importing stuff and probably from those countries that we actually still get custom paid for, you know? If I, if I thought about it in a more logical way as someone who's working with materials like that, I think, uh, I think some of the things the government should have thought about initially was, you know, like start thinking about putting farmers into producing cotton like they used to do in the 80s, build generis for it. Uh, figure out ways. There's a lot of new technology spinners because the, there is a place in Kitui that does silkworm. They make their own silk. Like try and help a lot of people get into that. The other thing that I also thought is important is we don't necessarily. We have a lot of people who have meetings, uh, meetings for mentoring designers, meetings for. But we don't really have technical like polytechnic where someone can say, "I'm going to learn how to spin cotton." You know, we don't have that. So even if you actually build these industries, who's going to run them? Who's going to produce? Who? No, all the young people are going to riding motorcycles. You know. There's nothing, there's no, there's nothing that can make people want to go and learn. And I think having like mini polytechnics where you can learn how to do like tailoring used to be done before, where you can go and learn how to spin cotton, how to, how to grow your own cotton, you know, it becomes easier for people to actually transition because they can actually see an added value when they actually get involved in it. But right now I don't, I think, the the added value might not necessarily be for the young entrepreneurs who want to dive into it. I think it's going to be more for the bigger industries who will be producing it. Maybe they will be able to hire a few contract workers once in a while, but I think majority of the youth will still be left out, even though we are trying to build, you know, an economy for the younger youth. Okay. Um, Terihan, Terihan uh, one of the things that we've known is that the cottage industries in the European countries or in the American countries were really supported. Uh, as, an, as the chair of our Pan-African entrepreneurs, do you see that happening in the near future within our society, within the nation? And is there hope? Of course there's hope. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an optimistic person, so I, I will stick with the hope for now because without it, then what do we have? Uh, but I'd also like to echo what, uh, what both uh, Mr. and uh, Monsieur Le Steven and Ruth have said, you know, there is, there, is the willpower really there? You know, we, um, if I've, I wanted to take notes when Ruth was, you know, just taking us through uh, the value chain and what that value chain, for instance, for culture would look like, the kind of um, services, the kind of uh, different businesses that can be really built uh, and skills that can be built around an, an industry, such as the cotton industry. And it's not as if the government does not know how important an industry like that would be. But as uh, Mr. Stephen mentioned earlier, where, where are our priorities currently? Um, so as you mentioned correctly, Josiah, I sit on, I'm a patron of the Pan-African Business Women Association, which is uh, chaired by a deputy minister in South Africa, Pinky Kekana. And basically the organization is structured around how do we, what role can we play within the spaces that we're in to ensure the, when the AFCFTA, which is the free continental trade area um, for Africa eventually becomes a reality, how do we speak up for the women? How do we get more women to find out where the opportunities are? However, of course, now with the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a lot of uh, back and forth of uh, when the um, AFC FTA will really be launched. Remember, it had been set for the 1st of July, uh, at least for the kickoff and the conversations into breaking down the barriers and the walls, um, you know, issues such as customs that Ruth had, had talked about earlier. With COVID-19, um, it looks like that goalpost will have to be shifted a little bit as governments and heads of state focus on just dealing with that pandemic first. However, if it does come to place, if we begin to really have genuine and open conversations, 
we should not let the good crisis go to waste. You know, we've seen what has happened to our regular and traditional intercontinental trade routes. Um, let's talk of China, of Europe and ETC. But it does give our African states an opportunity to really relook at trade amongst ourselves. If Ruth, if it was easy uh, for Ruth to import something from Tanzania, than it is for her to bring something from China. She's not only growing the Tanzanian economy, but she's also growing the Kenyan economy and the African economy as a whole. I mean, we're, as an African economy, we're sitting on you know, a $3.4 trillion economic block. If we really break down these barriers, and, and it goes back down to willpower, which uh, Mr. Stephen uh, talked about earlier, as an East African community, it should be absolutely easy for Ruth to cross the Tanzania border pick up something and come back because it should be on market essentially. Um, and so if we're speaking about an African market, we must then begin to push our leaders to start looking at East Africa because that's the smallest place to start with. And as journalists and as media, I sit on the, on the board um, as a media practitioner and as a media influencer as well. So for us, it's, it's going back and talking to our colleagues and saying, can we highlight stories? Can we highlight the policies that need to be built around you know, opening up uh, trade for women and not only women, but even small entrepreneurs across, across Africa. So, so we're sitting on, on a great opportunity, even though it is within the COVID-19 pandemic, but it's a time for Africa to really look back and rethink and say within our spaces, you know, yourself as Jan, for instance, yourself as Josiah, Stephen, what can you do within your space to ensure that one leader, two leaders are beginning to really think of what uh, you know, a bigger trade area can mean for us as a Kenyan economy. So that's that's where my mind has been, and it's been interesting just listening to to everyone bring in their comments. And for me, it's like every point is a story that you know that needs to be told. So I'm very happy to be here today because I I want to be able to tell those stories as well. Okay, so at this particular moment, I hope everyone of us is following the conversation via our social media. Uh, sites and I'm going to bring my co-panelists to just give us uh, my co-moderator to just give us an insight as to how things are from the social end. Are there questions? Are there things that we need to uh, answer as concerns from the participants? Thank you, Josiah. Um, so I've been looking up the discussion on, on Twitter and also on the chat and there's a lot going on. Uh, so right now we are trending at uh, number three with social market economy KE on Twitter in Kenya. Um, there are many tweets picking up the notions um, from the movie, um, but also from the discussion um, about what the government does and does not do to facilitate uh, businesses, especially small businesses, about taxation, about uh, the custom and, and uh, trade, import, export business of Kenya, um, but also the role of women in the economy itself, but also in the public, um, in the public media, um, which, so for example, John asks uh, on Twitter, how do we place or make women in, in business more prominent uh, also as a, um, as a role model for future generations or for current generations who are still maybe in university um, and who will be the entrepreneurs of, of tomorrow, if not today already. Um, so much um, discussion on, on Twitter, also here in the chat. Um, I, I see that Ruth is already uh, answering some of the questions there. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so again, we are turning on number three and uh, try to keep the numbers up there. Um, any insights, share on Twitter or share in the, in the chat. We also got some questions in the Q&A, um, many of them to Ruth about um, the role of, of mentorship um, in building a business, about inspiration, um, but also, again, um, on the international side of the business and um, especially with, with fashion industry being a global business, but also having always been um, the foundation of economic growth, historically speaking, especially the garment industry. Um, what is the role of, of Kenya here? 
Um, so yeah, many, many topics on the medias, um, and I think lots to discuss still in the remaining minutes. Uh, back to you, Isaiah. Um, thank you so much, uh, Christoph, for the updates from the online activities. Uh, one of the questions that is coming out for you, uh, Ruth, is that do you have a mentor? Who mentored you through? Who, who picked your hand and ensured that every journey that you took, they were watching your steps? And do you have people who you're mentoring currently? Um, okay, so um, I think uh, sometimes it's important also when you're studying, you know, like when you have a, when you have an idea of what you want to do, I think it, it sometimes starts with family and, and I've been lucky enough to have, you know, my family understanding maybe it's also because i had an older brother who was an artist so it was a little bit easier for my parents to understand a little bit because he did that full time so i think it was easier for them to understand the path i was taking and it was easier for them to just let me be um but it's also the motivation sometimes is partly my family, my sisters, my brothers, everybody who believes in you makes you feel like, yeah, I'm on the right road. But I have to say that your clients too, you know, and, and most of my clients end up being my friends. I mean, I mean that work at home. So they end up being my friends. And just the feeling when you do something and you see someone glow gives you the motivation to keep going. I think that's one of the most important things. I always tell a lot of designers and, and by the way, you, like I say, you don't have to be born creative. You can learn to be creative too. So this is not just, for, you know, like when, when you see the story, I was one of those people who was talented from, I guess, when I was young that I knew I wanted to be an artist, but there are also people who, who, who love it. So they, they learn to be creative, they learn to be designers. And this is also for them. It's just so that you understand that if you, if you like it, do it. Like I, I think uh, there's a notion where a lot of people are a little bit nervous, like will someone like it? Will I sell it? How will people think about this? Like you kind of second guess yourself and even like me, being whatever I am, I second guess myself a lot too. But I, I learned to to tell myself that if I like it, I'll at least if I made a dress that I like and I never sold it, I'll wear it because I like it. You know what I mean? Um, and so I always tell people that it's important to just do what you love. You you need to to also a lot of designers because I saw a question about that. So I think I'll just combine it. Um, a lot of people need to learn to read. Like there's nothing new as a designer. Like, you know, there's a lot of issues because someone mentioned something about why is it that other like music have their own association, artists. Like a lot of art designers are scared of collaborating. And most of the time it's because of theft. And I always say there's nothing new, nothing. If it's dresses, they've been done since Temi Memorial. It's just that special touch that you add that makes it you. You know, what is it that, that when someone sees, it's like, this is me. Whether it's a bag, it's jewelry. Because now everybody seems to do things and they all seem to look the same. And you see someone doing the same thing and you get angry that they're copying you. There's a copyright act, yes. But I mean, everybody's gonna copy everybody. You know what I mean? So we just have to believe in what we do. And we need to learn to also as designers figure out how we can work together. I think as much as the government wants to work with people and help people, it's also a little bit difficult if you have to like Terry and you have to meet me individually, then you go meet another designer individually because we can't sit together and come up with a plan because we are all scared that if we do, then someone's gonna steal your idea, you know? <laughs> And that's what happens all the time as designers. It's like you're always very scared of working, of collaborating, 
because every single time you collaborate, then they're scared that someone's going to steal their design. So, good. so that's one issue. The other issue is about, you know, we can't afford to copyright everything we design. We don't have money to be paying lawyers to go and, you know, figure out, you know, this design that was produced by this person and you have to go to court and you have to pay the lawyers just for a design that should have cost you, what, 4,000 shillings and you end up spending so much. So I guess that's why also a lot of people don't copyright their stuff. I don't. But then it, it also becomes flattery, but at the same time, it hurts as a designer when you create new things and people copy. So it's like a catch-22 when you're a designer. Um, but when it comes to motiv motivation, like you mentioned before, like motivation, inspiration, all that stuff comes from also the people around you. I think it, you get motivated when sometimes someone says you're on the right road and it, it can be your family it can be your friends you know it can be your clients just that feeling where some you look someone looks at you and they say yeah this is really great just makes you feel like yeah i think i'm on the right road you might not sell a piece after a month especially now with the COVID issues but um we always have to just remember that there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, really. I don't know if I answered all the, all the questions. Yes, yes, you've, you've captured a lot. Probably the one that you'd come back to is if you do have mentors uh, that you're mentoring friendly. Jean, uh, um, one person is asking, is uh, saying something? Yeah. I mean, you asked me about mentors. If I have any mentors, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't have mentors, but I mentor. And I have people that I mentor. And most of the people I mentor are my workers that I mentor. And I think um, just being able to teach them uh, is an investment. Being able to train them is an investment. And that's why I think it's also important um, that when you're, when you're working with people who, like, you know, the, art, the, the people who work for me, my workers, you spend so much time trying to teach them the right way, the best way that you don't want them to go. So I think that's also one of the reasons why I mentioned, you know, you have to learn to, to pay them well because you might train someone so well and then they leave you and then they go to someone else just because the money is better. So some of those are some of the things that I think I kind of tried to mention in the, in the movie. Uh, but when it comes to me being mentored, no, I don't. I, I think, no. <laughs> um, I think I've, 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 I sometimes I say, it, which might be quite arrogant and boyish that um, I think I've reached that point when I feel sometimes that I, I, I know more. And I, I, I think I can only, guide, I think with all the knowledge that I know, I think the most important thing is to disseminate the knowledge I know and not just to keep adding it to whatever little that I have already garnered over the years. So I would like to have like, you know, be able to have people to train, but that becomes a completely different job. Like, it's like, I have to decide whether I'm going to run a business or I'm going to train people, you know. So for right now, what I do is just to train the people and mentor the people I have. I also have a few client friends who I, I'll give consultation and I help them also to try and build their businesses. Uh, where necessary. Um, and that's like basically uh, working with other people as well, just to teach them uh, how to start and how to go about the ropes that so they don't have to make the same mistakes that I basically made when I was studying. And I think you saw Nina, she's one of the people that I work with. What about the call log event? Uh, thank you so much. Jean, one of the questions that are coming up is when you see conversations like Roots, and the other time it was uh, the doctor's conversation, what, what are you aiming at as an organization in Kenya? What movement or what change of action 
are you seeking to stir amongst the society? As the connection was not perfect, but I think I got the question. So why are we doing this and what are we aiming on? Huh? Um, as I said at the beginning, we, as a political foundation from Germany, try to connect political issues between the two countries, between Kenya and Germany. And um, I think we, you know that the Germany is a country that is very um, active in, in global markets and um, needs partnership with other countries also in the economic sector. So that's why we think it's, it's a good uh, idea to talk about social market economy and to see if we have partners that also want to have a free market with social frameworks around these. Um, I think Ruth mentioned that right now. It's, for example, an issue if you have high customs that, that protect markets where you actually don't need to break any market because if you don't grow cotton, you don't need to protect cotton. Um, you have the same things in Germany here where you if you do not um, put um, trade taxes on raw materials because you need them to produce your materials. And um, so we think it's, it's good if we think in many countries about these, about these topics. Um, this can, for example, lead to global trade deals that may be more advantageous for both countries at, at the same side. But there are many aspects about that. There's a interest on a high level on, on high policy making. Um, but we also um, I think, as I said at the beginning, that democracy, which we want to support with our work uh, in Kenya and all over the world, needs people that are responsible, that, that want to change something on the side that want to do something that is important for them. And one group that definitely wants good policy frameworks for themselves are entrepreneurs. Because as Ruth just, just man mentioned, um, you need um, for example, um, um, an enabling tax regime, you need um, useful customs um, laws. You also need some education back, uh, background to have people that can work for you as, as employees. And, um, and we would like to support this process. And um, that's why, as I said also for the last time, we would like to kind of collect people through this discussions we're doing right now that would go, like to go with us um, to, to work on some reforms, some concrete policy reforms that can be small things, so like um, pushing for maybe some subsidies for, for small companies or to, to discuss about the custom regimes. And this is possible because we have the networks to, to the policy circle, as we can see by Mr. Stephen Yam Schuder, who is here with us today. Um, there are many people that we, we could find and try to team up with to, to come to some smaller creative solutions. And um, that's why I would ask all of you here in the panel, but also the participants and uh, people watching us today, um, to come back to contact um, Cass and to see what we can do together and how also our foundation, the Colorado Foundation, can support any processes that lead to a, yeah, to a social market economy, to a more social market economy in Kenya. Um, and we offer our partnership for that because we consider it our task to um, not to teach things, but to be a partner in, um, in policy reforms that would be useful for entrepreneurs in Kenya, but also for Colorado Foundation here. I hope that answered your question. Yes, Jan, uh, it answers your question. And uh, so then I, I, the, I noticed there's a lot of concern and, and uh, questions from people who are wondering then how do they submit their documentaries or they submit their stories and they want to be part and parcel of this. Ravi people are saying you've done a good job. They also want you to tell their story. So those are some of the things that are going to come through the conversation as we go on. But even beyond this conversation, I know it's something, Jan, Jan, this is just going to stoke a conversation to another level because there are, there are several people like uh, Dr. Okot. There are several people like uh, Ruth whose stories have not been told yet. So they might be able to come back to you or come back to Cass and say that we also want our to be. Is there space for people? Yes, there's always space. Um, I mean, of course, we, we don't have unlimited resources. So 
producing a film does cost money. Um, of course, we can push Ravi to do it for free, but also it's it's his enterprise um, to, to do films, so that won't work. Um, so, of course, we cannot do this unlimited times, but we can do this once in a while. Um, what people can do is, the best way is to contact us via our Facebook page. Um, that's the easiest way if you go to Conrad, um, hash Adenauer, hash Stiftung, Stiftung, um, hash Kenya on our Facebook page, you can contact us there. And we look at this um, regularly and then we'll respond to that and, um, and then take it from there. So please do this here. Otherwise, if you cannot contact the Facebook page, you can also um, contact Christoph um, through, the, through the chat, the chat we're having here and, um, and share your details. The best would of course be to do this in a private chat that you don't uh, disclose your details to everybody. Um, but the easiest way still is the direct messenger service through Facebook, because then we can easily frame the people that contact us from there. Okay. So folks said again that we have several beautiful stories that are out there. So if you know of a story that needs to be told, if your story needs to be told, you still have space so that then it can be articulated well. And if it passes uh, the threshold of what we are looking for, then probably who knows, it's your story that we'll be watching next time here. Ruth, I come back to you again. And this is now on the basis of the market. They are the people wondering that are your products for the Kenyan market? Are your products for the international scene? And there's one particular question that I've gotten from Crystal Asige, the, 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 the renowned artist, the, the, the musician. She's asking, is our fashion industry up to the standard of international levels or what do we need to do to get to that level of the international aspects? Yes, I think we are. I think I think we are because I'll give you an example. Whenever, okay, so I, I don't know how to phrase this, so I'm just going to talk about it randomly, but maybe you'll be able to get bits and pieces. Um, it depends on the fashion. This is the first time actually that I have, and I, and I explained to Ravi, that I have actually come out as a designer and put my stuff out there. I don't do media stuff. I don't do articles. I don't do TV. I don't do any of that. I just, as a designer, I believe that what I want to do is um, to do the best I can for myself. You know, like I don't need acknowledgement from anybody to explain to me that I'm good at what I do because I know I am. Um, but when you start thinking about markets, I think I have done everything on my own. I have, I applied for exhibitions in the US. I did it on my own. I wrote emails, can I come? You know, the first time I didn't get a visa. I tried the second time I got a visa. Um, and I went with nothing, just two suitcases and I'm going to do this on my own, you know? And then you reach there and you realize, oh my God, everybody likes your stuff. Like there's no avenue that provides people with that kind of you know, exposure. So how would you know if you really are, if you don't try? How would you know how, how, would you know how to validate yourself? How good Kenyan designers are if you don't give it a shot? Like you really have to give it a shot to be able to know. But there are a lot of really amazing designers in this country who produce some still do fashion weeks today. today you know, people used to go to New York Fashion Week. We see that happening. We have others who stock luxury designer brands in Kenya. I mean, luxury designer brands, like who thought that they'd be in Kenya? But we do have. Um, so competitively with the world, I think we are up there. Um, but when it comes to thinking about uh, markets, um, the Washington consulate, uh, uh, the, the markets here, there are a lot of people who, who help, who support. Like I do exhibitions. I used to do exhibitions until this COVID thing happened at the US embassy where you're called and you said, come and display your stuff in the market. Um, 
So they had like summer cells, they have winter cells. Uh, so in December and in May, they had cells where they call different artisans to go in and exhibit their stuff and you sell. Uh, you always see pop-up stores happening in Yaya Center. You see some in most malls when you walk in, there are people selling. So the market is diverse. Um, I don't necessarily think that uh, when I started my business, I called it black fly because I wanted black people to be fly. But my business now has become something else. I still kept the name, but it's become something else because um, what my concept of at the beginning was to dress Kenyans, make dress Kenyan, Kenyan, Kenyans look nice in the outfits I made. But you have to learn to also grow with your products. So if it changes, you should be ready to change with it. You know, and my business is diverse. It's now changed to whatever, you know, and I believe it will be something else as we keep going, but I'm ready to move with it. I'm not constricted and say, I will only design for the Kenyan market. I'm going to design only for the European market. And in that form, of thinking like that, then you also have to learn to understand what is it that this market wants? What is it that if I had to design for Europe, would I give them yellow? You know what I mean? Like, why would you do that? Or you have to do a lot of reading to understand so that you can build the market to be the target you want. You don't necessarily sometimes also have to wait for the target market you want to come to you, you know? And I think that's what I have been. I have, my business has evolved to something I don't know. I have moved with it as it grows. And I have learned over the journey that if I want to design for the Kenyan market, this is what I'm going to give them. If I want to design for the American market, this is what I'm going to give them. And so from there, you're able to change the target market depending on who you want to sell to. Say something about so, the American market. The, the American market is a lot of people are ready to accommodate. And, and, and the thing is, you also have to realize that the American market, which is what I also work with. When I started, I had no idea what I was getting involved in, but then I learned that I want to be also one of those people to educate the American market. And that's why sometimes when I go to the US, I want to use African fabrics. I don't want to use Chinese kitenge. No, I want to make sure I have a story because at that point you're also educating them and say, this is made in Burkina Faso. This is produced in Kenya. This is done in Tanzania. This is done by these women. So it's like, it becomes very fluid whereby you're also giving someone else information that they didn't know in an educative way by actually wearing something that they understand the story about. And I think a lot of designers need to strive to do that. Like don't just think in a functional way, but also think in an educative way because the educative way also makes you have to read to know because if you don't know, you can't sell something you don't know. And I think a lot of people, because we are so used to copying to make money and always think about money, we kind of sometimes backstep the part where we have to start thinking if someone asks you, what is this material? You're gonna say, I'm using 100% cotton, but you didn't make it. So how do you know it's 100% cotton? Most European countries want you to put a tag. How is it washed? How is it clean? What materials is it? If it's coming from China, you don't know. Is there anyone who's gonna test it for you? You have to pay to get it tested. Does, do you need labels? Yes, you need to pay for labels, you know? So I think those are some of the things that, you know, when you start getting into that, it's a lot of people assume it's easy. Like she goes, she does her markets in the States, she gets her markets in the Europe, in, in, in Europe. I have someone, a friend of mine, Mary, I don't know if she's online as well, who also has tried it. And, and you seem to understand the hardship of it, the hardship where the market is, it is there, I will not lie. There's a huge market in the US, there's a huge market in, the, in, the, in Europe. There's a huge market in Africa too. South Africa is a big market. They, sell, they buy a lot of Kenyan products. 
uh, in Nigeria has their own business, but we can also be everywhere if we want to, but we have to learn to read. We need to understand what you're selling. If you're going to sell me a Kitenge outfit, you need to tell me exactly what material, did you test it? You know, and I think sometimes I believe it's, it's just my imagination, but I also sometimes believe that maybe some of those are the reasons why people get sick because you don't know what you're wearing. You don't know, is it 100% polyester? Is it polyester and what, you know? Um, and I think also maybe like uh, Terry Anshabet mentioned, like those are some of the things that I think are important for, for, for if you're gonna build an economy where we are actually producing our own stuff, we need to start thinking about, you know, let's, let's be honest about the things that we use because a lot of people are not honest. And because my business, I try as hard as much as I can to make it an honest business. I think those are some of the core things that even for me as someone who exports has an issue with because I don't know. And that's also another reason why sometimes I end up using upcycle stuff because at least the label right is written that it is a t-shirt, 100% cotton, viscose, and I can be able to tell someone a little bit more about it. Like I bought it in the market, but it's 100% cotton, you know? And not that I got it from whatever, and I'm not even sure what material it is, but I still will sell it to you like it is 100% cotton when I'm sure it Thank isn't. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Bona Steven, when I, if I come to you, a number of entrepreneurs and a number of businesses that we do have, do they consider the social responsibility that they owe to their societies and communities? Hello. 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 Buenas, Stephen. Can, can you, you hear, hear me? me? You went off at a point. Please come again. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. we can hear you. No, I can hear yes, you. Yes, I am saying. Can you come do again? you feel that the entrepreneur and the business? Businesses that we have. Do you feel the businesses and the entrepreneurs that we have consider the social responsibility that they or their communities are within the society? Um, the big corporates are a disappointment. But if we go by the example of Ruth, then uh, we shall really get the kind of society that we want. Is an epitome of what the big industrialists or entrepreneurs should actually imitate. And that is the kind of society that we need because we must pay much attention to the nation's social welfare. And uh, she has a lot to teach us about that. And I would want to see this reflected uh, in big business upwards. Terian, what is your take on the same? Do we have businesses in doing that they do uh, put credence to social responsibility and the social aspect in their business? Is that still for me? Hello? That, that is for Terian. Terian, you could just have a rejoinder for the same. Yes, so I'll look at it from, from two sides. Um, so the concept of social responsibility has been, see, has been going through some sort of changes over the last few years, and um, it's now being called shared value uh, and all these uh, nice big names. Um, and because all a number of some of the big corporates, especially well, the private sector, some of the leading companies, sustainability has become a pretty strong arm um, um, of, of the organization. So we are beginning to see a bit more honesty 
within social responsibility when it comes to using the shared value concept. So the business is still making money while doing good. So um, I, I prefer the shared value concept other than just the um, CSR traditional uh, concept, because I think, you know, for a business to be, to be honest, then they need to make money as they're also, you know, doing good. So that's um, on one side of it. On the other side of SMEs, uh, I think there's so much that can be done. And just before I get to that, I want to pick on something that Ruth mentioned about ethics uh, and, you know, what she feels as a clash of uh, credibility when it comes to people supplying, uh, you know, they say this is 100% cotton, yet it really isn't because they, they don't really know. So ethics and is a, is a key component of, uh, of the social economy, you know, and integrity. So even as we think about giving back to the society, then ethics has to come back in in a, in a pretty strong, strong manner. So, uh, you know, it's perhaps there's a lot of red tape around CSR and shared value within the corporate spaces, but there's so many small businesses in Kenya today, because I mean, they make the majority, they employ 70% of our employable people in the country today. So if, each small SME is challenged to do something in terms of shared value, not necessarily in terms of CSR. Uh, you know, it does give growth and impetus to, you know, the growth of the social enterprise sector or the social economy sector, so to speak. Um, I'm looking at a space like um, the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, the social economy grows in times like this. You know, there's so many, social challenges currently going on, um, but then there's also a space for social enterprise to then address all these solutions, all these problems, uh, to provide solutions to all the problems that we're seeing currently. And that, you know, does not have to be CSR, but it can be shared value. You know, I'm making money by seeing that there's a problem here, I can solve it, but still make money. And it doesn't mean that you have to be uh, you know, a billionaire of sorts. But in our own small ways, in the small businesses that we're running, can we create shared value? Can we take care of our employees better? Can we set up, you know, some sort of funds such as uh, what Ruth has done uh, for her, you know, for her, for her company? Can we talk to uh, insurance companies and negotiate deals on healthcare? or health you know, packages. So I think there's so many ways in which um, small businesses today can take advantage of the many challenges that are happening and not only make money from that, but actually create a difference in the society that they're in. Ravi, just, just on the same, uh, Ravi, I'm coming to you on the same aspect of social responsibility and this is when you provide a wider view in comparison to what is in Germany. Uh, what are some of the things that stand out when it comes to social responsibility when with the entrepreneurs and corporates when it comes to this society? Um, <clears throat> thank you, Josiah. Uh, well, I will, uh, if you allow me, then I will also put, uh, incorporate Christoph and uh, last not least Dr. Jan into this, um, into answering this question. Because uh, we, we three are brought up in Germany and uh, the social market economy was something we knew from, ch from childhood on, um, which stabilized our careers, which stabilized our economy, and uh, which, uh, to my way of thinking, and this is not, not a false patriotism, but is what I think one of the most successful society systems or society and economic systems in the world. Um, if you see where Germany stands today and has been standing in the last decades, it's also a product of a social market economy. So, um, and I think just uh, to give you a very personal uh, point of view, I think um, the 
the feeling or the you know it, it is also good does not only go go along with figures this also goes on with the with the uh, with, with the feel with the, with an emotion if you know that somehow there is a society which finally gives you strength if you if, if you stumble and which also gives you room to try out as Ruth has, has tried out a lot but I think she had to struggle much more than if she would have struggled in Germany uh, but if you have this kind of, of backing from a society, um, this gives you a lot of strength. And I think it also mobilizes a lot of energy um, from a lot of players in society. So, um, but again, mentioning Christoph and first of all, uh, Dr. Young, maybe they also could add that because my answer was now very much a gut, a gut answer. <laughs> and then Dr. Young, for, for instance, has more figures about that. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Jan, if you can provide more insights on the same, how does it look comparable? To, how does the German uh, social market economy look if you compare it to the Kenyan uh, market economy? Um, I think the, the central point is um, that you always need to, to think about the combination between a, a free market economy and social frameworks around that. Um, I think it's easy to understand if you look at the concept of, of corporate social re responsibility of CSR. That is a very American concept. Um, I think also can be used in Kenya, you need that. If you don't have the, the clear legislative frameworks for social protection and responsibility of, of companies. Yeah, you don't have that in the US. So that is, that's why you have these concepts in which you would ask companies to behave responsibly. And then they could put it into reports and, and hope that the people like it and buy the products. But if companies don't want to do that, there's no punishment for that. So then they can sell their products for, for, for less money and many people that, that just are price sensitive still buy it even though the employees are treated badly. The German solution was that even though you have a free market, you would introduce clear laws and frameworks on taxation, on labor regulation, and other things that actually are also controlled that force companies to behave correctly. So you don't need to do any reporting or any, any things to prove I do this correctly because it's clear either you do it or the company is closed down. And I think that's what, what Kenya would also need more. They're, they're, they're not only, they don't want to only find good um, labor regulations and, um, and other frameworks, but that also there's a control about that. So that people actually no, yes, I, I do have a, somebody did find a good enterprise and earns good money, but he or she does this because he also, or she also adheres to the laws and regulations. And I think that's very important. That's, I think, something that also Kenya could do a bit better because in many cases, people and businessmen or women that behave really badly get away with it and earn lots of money, but everybody around them suffers from that. Of course, it's not always the case, but you have these examples. And that is something I think that could be discussed to have stronger frameworks that actually look after that, that you actually adhere to the rules. Um, and as Ravi um, proposed, maybe also Christoph would like to add something on social market economy um, in the context um, from the German experience. Uh, thank you. Um, actually, not too much to add. Um, I think the, the key point of, of the social market economy is that it's uh, different from a state capitalist economy. In that the the, the government or, or the state actors um, do not directly interfere in the market, but only um, go there through the framing order of the market, um, and and the government has to do that because otherwise there will be that race to the bottom that that Jan just described, and um, but still the the government itself has no place in the market because the market um, is open to to producers and to consumers to reach an, a, a free agreement. Um, and only on, on the places where we see that that agreement is somehow against the public interest, um, where we say, okay, there, there's a product that should not be traded on the market, um, maybe drugs or weapons, or just something that's, that's unethical. Um, or where we see that there's no fair competition between the people joining in on the market, on the consumer side or on the producer side, on the supply side, 
um, then also the state has to interfere, intervene um, to make the competition fair again. But that's the only role that the state has to play. Um, and that makes the, the market, the free market, uh, a soft, far free market, um, efficient. That's where we generate wealth and welfare for the, for the society. And that's where we also then um, get the, the profits to, um, to introduce the safety net um, to then have more market actors and to have more trade on the market. One of seven as your parting shot. Do we have hope that this country is going to formulate policies that empower the entrepreneur, but also ensures that the social responsibility within the country? Uh, I still believe that we have um, uh, spots of voice of reason in there that uh, will stir the conscience of uh, our leaders, I think, to focus on the right things in this country, in politics, in the governance, and in everything. Otherwise, if we turn our heads away from that, uh, we shall necessarily have to be reminded by serious issues arising like industrial analyst and uh, the disrupt uh, disruptive effect is what will possibly force our leaders to think twice about whether they are leading this country properly or not. So uh, I have hope that uh, the voice of conscience in the name of uh, NGOs, the original NGOs, mm -hmm. I think were perfect. But um, the level of responsibility and accountability is deteriorating. I don't know where this satanic force is finding room in our ministry to turn us away from being good to one another and doing the right thing for each other. So, Let's also start the religious fraternity, I think, to use their spiritual power, I think, to put this country on the right track. That we may all live the way we want to in terms of loving one another and helping one another uh, in whatever position. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Stephen. Uh, Terian, as you uh, unpitch your tent, is there hope for the entrepreneur in Kenya? And is there hope that there are policies that will be formulated that favors the entrepreneurs that are around? And do we have a place for them to ensure that there is corporate social responsibility? Mm -hmm. Well, wow. okay, thank you for that. Um, in terms of hope, we have to have hope. Whether or not um, there will be policies put in place as fast as we hope they will, uh, whether or not the current politicians have the willpower to make sure that entrepreneurs thrive in the environment that we're in today, we still have to have hope. Uh, you know, we know where the focus and the mood of the uh, political class currently is. But still entrepreneurs will continue to work. Entrepreneurs will continue to build their businesses. They will still continue to create jobs. So I have hope. Um, I have hope for uh, Kenyan entrepreneurs. I have hope for African women entrepreneurs, especially because there's so much potential within the entire continent. As a journalist, I've traversed you know, the continent from the North to the South, the East to the West, and it's always amazing to see the entrepreneurial stories from across the region. So can we trade with each other? Absolutely. We will need the policies to ensure, you know, either when it comes to customs, when it comes to freight charges, when it comes to, uh, you know, just easing of intercontinental trade. Yes, we do need the willpower, which is why I think my most important takeout out of our conversation today is the role of partnerships. 
and you know just pulling in what your strength is what my strength is and then working together to see how can we all play you know in the littlest way possible or in the biggest way possible to push for policies that will make sure entrepreneurial uh, entrepreneurs find a space to really grow their businesses and 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 to make an impact um, on the csr um, perspective as well. I'll pick up from a point that was raised earlier on policies around CSR and just the formulation of that space. I, I do not know within the Kenyan space um, how that has been, if that has been very successful. I have seen and I have covered stories across the continent of CSR and shared value initiatives that have made a difference in the lives of many, many young people. Uh, my challenge now would be for small entrepreneurs to also find spaces where they can make an impact within, you know, the, the social um, community as well. You know, just making or connecting the dot between the social space and um, the economic side of things. But I think it starts here. It starts with such conversations. It starts with, uh, you know, a panel like this as well, which will, which is bringing in different thoughts, different views, uh, and different challenges to us as well. Ruth, as you unwind your tent, some of the things that you tell an entrepreneur, what is that message of hope for the young entrepreneur coming up and is going through the challenges and successes that you have undergone? And beyond that, then, what is your hope within the entrepreneurial space within the country? and even within the continent as well. Okay, there you go. There are a lot of people who want to get into business. Uh, this is the time actually for a lot of people to start questioning, you know, with I mean, this whole COVID thing happening, there are a lot of people who just are like, we have to get into business. We have to do something. Um, there are those people who have been thinking about it. And I mentioned, I think the first, the first thing you have to do is to start. Like, don't, don't procrastinate, just do it. Um, don't give up because the, it's going to be a long road. I mean, I've gone through it. I'm lucky that um, I was able to get out of school and get a job. And then I was able to also get employed. And I mentioned at a point that um, it's, it's important for you to, um, stop doing that. Um, it's important for you to, you know, start, get, get a job, start work, learn from there. The best thing, imagine how nice it is that you get paid and you learn, you know? Uh, a lot of people don't go through that. Uh, so if you're out of school and you want to start business, at least try and get employed, even if it's for a year, you learn all the tricks and trades from someone else's business so that you don't have to make those mistakes when you start, because that takes a lot of time before you actually understand the, the strings that go with it. Uh, it's also important for you to learn the crafts, like try and be really good at what you do. And I think that's one of the things that I can usually say is an accomplishment. Like I feel like every day is a learning curve. I feel like I have been able to learn the craft to be better at both making handbags, making clothes, making jewelry. Like I really can say that I am good at it. And therefore you don't have to always depend on someone. If, if your tailor walks out of you, you'll be like, okay, fine. I'll, I'll sit on the machine and do it. You know, like that I think is an empowering thing for a lot of young people where you don't have to get someone, you don't have to depend on someone for you to actually build your business. I think it's important for everybody who's studying business to, be good at it. So if anything happens, you're ready to take over, you know, and I had to learn the hard way through that. Um, learn about functions, learn about your market, uh, do as much research as you can. Uh, 
once you start, you realize there are a lot of things that are not standard anymore, like necessarily applicable in real life. You know, pick those things and move with it you know, try and build something. If it means like for people who are doing fashion, uh, like I said, there are a lot of things I've learned in fashion that is not book, in, it's not in the book and no one's gonna teach you about it. But you have to sit down and, and think about it realistically. Is it applicable? Am I gonna make an outfit in the standard measurement that I use for one of my clients in China because it's a standard measurement and do it for an African body. It just doesn't work and it's not in the book. So you have to make that your own, you know, build your own if you have to for people who are getting into fashion. Um, okay. Uh, uh, I think in a nutshell for, uh, be think about quality don't do things just because you have to make money you know stand by your word okay uh, and be honest about it i think that's also one of the things that has built me to where i am now okay ravi as you unwind your tent uh just uh, pass a shot on the shared responsibility that we we must inculcate in our the shared responsibility just talk about the shared responsibility as you wind up your speech the shared responsibility that we must inculcate into our entrepreneurs and the startup businesses that we have Sorry, um, I had, um, uh, Josiah, could you repeat your, your question uh, once more on, um, um, on one of each side? I don't know, I didn't, didn't get the question right. And I, I'm saying that uh, as you wind up your tent, I'm just asking you to wind from the perspective of what is the aspect, what is that space for the aspect of shared responsibility with the entrepreneurs coming businesses? <clears throat> well, as uh, Dr. Yan mentioned uh, half an hour ago, um, um, I, I'm an entrepreneur myself as well. So the only thing I, I can answer here at this point is teamwork. Um, and teamwork is it. So um, I really also like the aspect of respect, which uh, um, Ruth pointed out several times also in our interview. And uh, in the film also at the end, it's about respect, respecting everybody in the team because everybody is important. And uh, may, maybe there's a good metaphor, like, you know, um, um, if, it, if it comes to soccer or football, um, you have 11 people on, 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 the, on the pitch. So <laughs> everybody's important, you know, so uh, to, to win the match. So I think this is something you, you have to respect in whatever you are doing. <clears throat> whether it comes to computer um, engineering or to fashion or to filmmaking, to bank business, um, mentor everybody, take them more serious, try to, to, um, to coach them. So people will think, uh, thank you for that and try to give their best. And may I finally also um, come okay. back to you. I, I think um, what she has achieved in her company is exactly the, the aspect of to enhance team working um, by, um, um, by the introduction of a social care uh, kitty she installed and was really, I think it, it worked very well. That's what she pointed out and the workers respected that very well and they're working much better than they did before. I don't know whether I answered your question to be honest because I didn't get your uh, 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 question right due to technical problems. Forgive me, thank you. It's all right. Uh, Christoph. do we have any quick updates from the other end as you do your closing speech? Uh, sorry? Do we have any other updates from the online fraternity as you do your closing remarks? Um, the, the discussion is still going on. Um, so many more tweets coming in. Um, I think by now we are trending on number two already, so maybe we can get to, to the top uh, tonight still. 
Um, it was a very interesting discussion. Um, as I as I just said before, um, in, in the market, uh, in the social or free market economy, um, the competition is what uh, what is the, the benefit of it, um, which makes innovation, um, which also makes uh, stuff cheaper that we want to buy uh, because more people will buy it. Um, but when it gets problematic is when the competition doesn't have uh, is somehow unfair and the state does not intervene and, and change the regulation. Um, that's um, that's when um, social or that's when um, entrepreneurial responsibility comes in. And that's what Ruth uh, does with Blackfly. And that was other um, entrepreneurs have to do when uh, the state does not um, regulate the way it should be um, to, to keep the public okay. interested. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for your uh, being part and parcel of this conversation. And we thank you so much for the panelists. We are heading home and uh, this is going to be done by none other than the country director for Conrad Adenauer Steve Tang. Uh, Dr. Jean, um, the time is up for you to close up, give us the closing remarks for the event that we've had today. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Josiah, for the moderation. And um, yeah, thanks everybody on the panel that you stayed with us for all the two hours and um, did not leave before that. Um, that doesn't happen all the time, so thanks very much. I think there was a very interesting discussion. We I personally learned a lot about the, the fashion market, which I actually did not uh, know before. Um, I think we had also good discussions about, um, about social responsibility of entrepreneurs. And um, I would like to, to carry this discussion forward, as I mentioned before. Um, we, we did start the discussion about um, how, to, how to get obstacles for entrepreneurs out of the way through policy frameworks um, after the last video. Therian was part of that. Um, we would carry on with this. We would try to um, team up with policymakers, entrepreneurs, other people interested in that, to really push for policy reforms that um, make entrepreneurship easier in Kenya, in Kenya and also include aspects of social market economy into this. So as I said before, everybody who would be interested in that, please let us know easiest way is through our Facebook page. And um, then we try to work on a mid and long term perspective on, on reforms. Of course, we as a German foundation could only support these ideas and, um, and the way forward needs to come from, from Kenyans. Um, but we'll be happy to, to do this together with all of you. So please don't um, consider this end of the discussion, but only the starting point of it. And um, yes, I re really, um, encourage all of you to be part of this and to work on this all together. So I wish you a very good evening. Um, everybody who has not been here from the beginning, the, the video is available on our YouTube channel. Um, so please look at that. We also find other videos on entrepreneurship on our YouTube page um, that may be interesting. Use the resources, please stay in contact with us and um, all the best for you and have a good evening and see you hopefully soon at a CAS activity. All the best.